Instead, we have the opportunity to make a habit of empathy, to recognize ourselves and each other. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. I'm here with Emily Gould, who has a website called Empathic, see it's EmpathicResolutions.com. It's Empathia. Oh, Empathia. Right. And um, I first came across uh, your, your work. Uh, you'd written an article for, I think it was the Vermont Lawyers, uh, I don't know, a magazine or journal or something. And you had written about uh, the role of empathy uh, within uh, mediation and conflict resolution. And I thought it was like one of the best articles I'd seen to really make that connection, you know, between uh, restorative justice, mediation, and, and empathy as kind of the foundation. So I had uh, contacted you and, you know, had talked to you before. And so I wanted to just kind of, kind of explore uh, just kind of your, your background and, and how you kind of got interested in empathy. Um, would you like to just introduce yourself more and, and just kind of talk about that? Sure. Uh, seems like, Edwin, you're really hoping to make a big difference with the work that you're doing. Yes? Oh, very much so, yeah. <laughs> and really, re really reach a broad audience. Yeah, and build a culture of empathy. See how we can uh, build a culture of empathy uh, to uh, raise the value of empathy within society. So um, I'm not seeing it as an on and off uh, you know, it's, you have empathy or no empathy. It's like kind of gradations. So I'm kind of just trying to see how we can raise the empathy temperature within society a little bit. And uh, I've seen that you're, you you have one finger on the thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, of course, empathy is. Uh, a tool of the trade in many professions, certainly in many of the healing professions. Empathy is part of the curriculum and is part of how many professionals think of going about doing their work. But uh, in fields such as law and uh, dispute resolution, uh, it's a, more of a newer idea. And I think those of us who have practiced law for a long time have much to learn from the other professions, including the business world where empathy is uh, now part of the curriculum in many B-schools and part of how people think about going about creating, creating uh, value in the world. But actually, my uh, experience of the effectiveness of empathy was in my early years as a trial lawyer. I was actually a criminal prosecutor for 15 years, many years. And one's effectiveness, well, in law enforcement, you're dealing with encountering people who are suffering all the time, whether it's uh, crime is one of the most painful aspects of contemporary life. And uh, so I found myself speaking to people who uh, had been victimized and in their heart of hearts thought that no one really cared or could ever understand what their experience was. And so the thought of participating in some public process about this very painful thing felt very unattractive to many of the people who I encountered as a young prosecutor. And 
it was hard to know how to be with people who were in such pain. It really was. And it was hard to know how to really answer their fear that no one would ever really care or really believe. Um, and the risk of being, of having one's pain uh, minimized or ignored uh, was so awful. Um, and I, I had to learn how to be with that. And so in order to function in my job, I had to develop an understanding of the value of what it is to simply have someone be present to another person's experience. So the only thing I could say to the people who I was working with is that, yeah, we don't know what the outcome might be. It's always kind of up for grabs what's going to happen in the legal system. Uh, but we will go through it together, whatever it is. We'll go through it together. I'm here. I have my skills. Uh, I have my team. But mostly, I'm just here. And as a result, uh, of this approach, I started to be able to handle kinds of cases that really had never been held, handled before. Uh, I ran a federally funded program that prosecuted crimes that took place in psychiatric facilities, staff on patient, and I did a lot of sexual abuse work, and this, these are types of cases that had never come to light before, had never been prosecuted. Um, and I was part of the, the sea change, really, in law enforcement, uh, where a unique marriage between, really, the, the women's movement and law enforcement was able to bring a change where the types of cases that society had always closed its eyes to. All of a sudden, we were able to talk about them and we were able to deal with them in courts. So that was really my first experience that empathy was a significant professional tool and really had some uh, value in creating significant societal change. Uh, in, as a society, uh, we treat abuse now completely differently than we did 30 years ago when I was a young lawyer. Um, uh, it's no longer a surprise that domestic abuse happens. It's no longer a surprise that child abuse happens. Uh, it's no longer a surprise that elder abuse or uh, uh, other kinds of abuse happen. And as a society, we've learned to uh, see this aspect of ourselves and talk about it and deal with it. And from my perspective, uh, empathy was a huge factor. And the integration of empathy into professional life was a huge factor in bringing about that kind of societal change. So my sense is that you're actually on the right track and when you and your colleagues who are doing this work, that you have put your finger on a human capacity that's been there all along. Uh, certainly the police officers that I worked with who may not have been trained in this way, uh, and there are there are people functioning professionally all over the world using this human capacity. It's not that we're discovering anything new by any means. If anything, we're rediscovering something that's always been there that we now are starting to see as part of the key to our survival. So that's how I uh, came to uh, uh, see the value of empathy in professional life. 
But it's almost because of that, that uh, at that time, uh, law seemed to be too narrow a confines to be able to do the kind of transformative work that interests me, and that's how I made the shift to to mediation and facilitation, which tends to have more flexible structures and allow for more of a transformative conversation to happen and can always happen in the courtroom. So, the, yeah. so you've, you've moved from the legal, which is, seems to be more, while it's been bringing in more empathy, it sounds like, that uh, it's still kind of set up in a confrontational mode and you're kind of moving, you've moved to more of the restorative uh, processes, restorative justice, uh, mediation type processes where maybe empathy is more, uh, more valued or more is used more? Or is well, uh, yes, I think uh, the world of dispute resolution was one of the first uh, law-related fields to really uh, see the value of empathy and I really credit the work of Marshall Rosenberg for raising the profile of empathy in the world of dispute resolution and for uh, offering uh, a definition of empathy that has certainly in my own professional life supported my own growth and capacity. Uh, I, I have huge respect for, for Marshall's work and I think he made a huge contribution to uh, the world of, of both dispute resolution and, uh, and negotiation and leadership. There are many uh, uh, thought leaders who have been informed by Marshall's work. I'm thinking of Bill Urey in the area of uh, negotiation and many others. Um, so I think that was a, in some way a turning point. Marshall's work was a turning point for many of us in terms of uh, seeing the applicability of uh, empathy to dispute resolution. But Law is a uh, critical piece in how we organize ourselves in society. And so I think the time is right to bring back to law what has been uh, developed in the fields of dispute resolution, leadership and negotiation, and now reintegrate that back into uh, the other aspects of social life uh, because they're all connected and we need to have a shared language across disciplines for what it is we're doing with each other and how it is we're going to start to solve the world's problems. Well, what I've uh, uh, come down to is about the centrality of empathy in a lot of these different fields. And that's what I've been trying to, uh, you know, work on and raise awareness around that so it sounds like uh, that's kind of what you've been seeing as well the yes uh, s slowly and gradually uh, some of this is a question of translation as the art as uh, uh, the article that I wrote for the Bar Association articulated the word empathy in law is still somewhat of a mismatch. Um, and many attorneys still see the word empathy as synonymous with sympathy and weakness. And of course, there's great truth to the fact that for those of us who are, fun the distinction between empathy and sympathy is, is very important. And because one is what allows us to be effective in the world and the other aware as it may be a very beautiful aspect of, of human life doesn't necessarily foster the kind of effectiveness that you are going to talk about. 
Um, so um, I think there's a, the time now is, is ripe for reintegration. And what I like about the work that you're doing is by raising the profile of empathy, you're really trying to um, express at its essence what is the source of energy that we can tap in ourselves as human beings that is a renewable, sustainable resource that can help us to move forward in a way that will do no harm and can realize the gifts with which we've been blessed as, as human beings. Yes, I and mean, that seems like that's what you're trying to do is to, to articulate an essence in its simplest form that is a source of renewal and, and growth of, for all of us as human beings. Yeah, yeah. and uh, creativity and connection. It seems that uh, we can have the dynamics that we see, for example, in, in our political system of two sides conflicting in conflict with each other and kind of the energy uh, seems to come. It's, I see it kind of as the metaphors of, of nuclear uh, f uh, fission. No, f let's see, with the atomic bomb, what is that? Nuclear fusion, right? So that's like, it's like, the energy comes from the break from the breaking apart of the atom, right? And there's all this energy that's kind of released there. But then there is nuclear fusion, where the atoms come together and merge, and there's a release of energy in that. And uh, with the nuclear fission, if there's all these byproducts, right? Anger and resentments and all this toxic waste. And uh, with fusion, there's like less of that. In fact, it, it's uh, kind of a clean energy. <laughs> That's a little bit of a metaphor I've been using. Um, and I see that pretty much in, in kind of the legal system is a lot like that. It's kind of like a kind of about conflict, whereas uh, restorative processes is more about bringing people together and, uh, you know, bringing people together for, through empathic connection. Well, I, I think you're right to contra compare and contrast uh, competitive versus collaborative systems. I suspect that a truly holistic approach will always require both. Uh, and that I see collaborative and competitive systems being in relation to each other. Uh, and. Uh, so it's, it's not a question of one or the other, but how, what are the commonalities uh, and how can we create a system that contain, contains both? So that's why you know, my, for me, uh, it wasn't enough to go off and become a mediator, although that has been certainly uh, a huge opportunity and I think society has much to benefit from institutionalizing more and more collaborative and cooperative systems. Um, but it's important to bring that back to the competitive systems that we have, uh, whether you, that be the electoral system or the uh, legal system and integrate uh, into each system the benefits of the other. So take the existing uh, um, competitive system and, and bring in more e empathy into that, into that existing structure and process? Yes, and uh, bringing more structure and formality uh, to uh, the collaborative system so that they can be more fully embodied in contemporary life. Well, the, the, uh, the way I've uh, kind of looked at this is how do we rate, how do we create a culture of empathy, um, which is, you know, just 
again, how do we transform society to raise the value of empathy within, and I just call that, the, you know, kind of a catchphrase, culture of empathy. And I was just wondering what your thoughts on that are, like what, you know, what can we do to to raise the value of empathy within society? And, and I don't know, does that even, maybe you could even say, does, does the idea or vision of a culture of empathy resonate or is it, or not, I guess? Well, I think it's a it's a terrific idea, and your articulation of it in in a simplest form is very useful. When things are expressed simply, uh, they uh, can spread more easily. Um, but at the heart of it, I think we can only give what we have. That's really the main uh, principle. It would be uh, easy to say the easiest way to spread a culture of empathy is to be empathic, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to offer empathy. Em empathy is an experience, right? That <clears throat> for the most part, we're starved for. Absolutely starved for. And the moment we experience or we have the opportunity to receive it. It feels so incredibly good, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think the, the easiest way to spread a culture of, of empathy is to offer it. Uh, because it feels good. But that's easier said than done, because the truth is we're all starved. And so uh, I think it really does begin with uh, our relationship to ourselves and developing practices for offering ourselves this quality of connection. Because really, that's the only way we have it to, to offer to, to others. Which isn't to say that uh, kindness to others or working to solve the world's problems isn't also a significant way to deepen one's compassion. And I think I've mentioned to you, I've started to be working in Rwanda with Mediators Beyond Borders. And uh, for some of us, the initial step will be in outer work. For others, it will be uh, through our own self practices for self care. But these two di dimensions are inextricably linked. And so, the more we take care of ourselves, the more we'll be drawn to engage empathically in the world. And I think the more we engage empathically in the world, the more we will notice and question the quality of the connection that we have with ourselves and in our intimate lives. So uh, regardless of where you start, you come back to that interconnection between the inner and outer world. I, we live in a, in Western society, the emphasis is very much on doing. And uh, uh, I think that has, that emphasis on doing is, has caused us to in part forget the richness of what it is when of what it is that's in us, including our capacity for compassion and empathy. So I think the more and more we integrate into Western life the practices that civilizations have known for thousands of years of how to cultivate uh, a rich inner life, I think the more we'll be able 
to uh, bring to the world in our obsession with doing. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that kind of uh, reminds me of just the, the definition of empathy. There seems to be a fair bit of confusion in terms of you know what the definition is and even from academics that i've read they tend to, they, there's a lot of different ways that they use the word empathy so i've been trying to kind of synthesize uh some of those different definitions and so far the one I, what i've kind of come up with is like four parts of empathy which is uh starting with i would call self-empathy which is maybe what you've just been addressing which is uh, mindfulness, sensory awareness, kind of a self-knowledge. Uh, and then the second part is that as we have that and our awareness can kind of open, that it opens us to uh, the mirrored empathy or sometimes called uh, by, in the, by the academics, uh, emotional or affective empathy, which is through mirror neurons. That as I'm watching you, I'm seeing how you're moving your body, and I can kind of take in that uh, that experience. And uh, and then there's uh, kind of the third part is a perspective taking, or kind of an imaginative empathy, which is where we can take the perspective uh, from someone else, like in acting. You know, actors do it, or we can. Uh, see what would the world look like if I was coming from that point of view and then the uh, fourth part is empathic action that once we have that resonance with each other that connection that we can work together uh, in uh, in kind of a harmonious empathic connected fashion and one of the definitions I've heard there that is that empathy is when the blocks to action are removed that don't exclude um, which was actually, I heard that from Dominic Barter, who does restorative circle process uh, in, out of Brazil, meaning that, uh, and, and maybe you, I, I've seen that also in uh, mediation, where uh, in a mediation, people are in conflict. They start you know, connecting with each other through the mediation. And then the last part is they look to the future of how they're going to work together and they start kind of brainstorming like what their plan of action is and that might be a bit of what you're talking about um kind of western society is kind of focused on let's get that action component working maybe without you know getting those other components so that's kind of like my working model kind of a map um kind of more of of empathy i'm just kind of wondering how that you know, resonates and with you. Uh, well, I like what you've done in terms of starting with the inner, with an inner felt experience uh, of awareness. Uh, of self-awareness. Uh, I think that's a good place to start. And it certainly is true that when that, when we're able to connect on that level with others, uh, that it does create a quality of connection that then uh, experientially in the world is just different and that's where things happen and people can relate to each other and the same people who are just uh, unwilling to even get in the same room with each other are all of a sudden seeing ways that they might uh, uh, cooperate and and help each other and work with each other and and serve others together so that sequence is uh feels authentic, it, it feels right. What um, the piece that I'm not hearing that for myself has been so transformative is distinguishing thoughts and feelings from needs. And again, this is an insight which I feel like, uh, I, I believe that Marshall Rosenberg has really uh, contributed to all of our understanding. Um, 
needs as being separate from our emotions and separate from our thoughts, but sort of boundless universal qualities that are comprised, that comprise our humanity. Uh, there's been so much work to, to, to demonstrate that certain needs are cross-cultural, they're universal, uh, we all uh, have them and recognize them, even though in this moment, not this, what's coming up for me as, as an important need or priority or value may be different from what's coming up in you. We all have the same set. And as long as we're talking about metaphors, uh, musical metaphors for me resonate as true when I think of the spectrum of needs. I think uh, needs are like pitches on a scale. They're distinct. Hope, trust, and faith are all distinct from each other, but they're kind of close together on the scale. Right? So we can think of a spectrum of tones, uh, each one with a different vibrational quality. And uh, distinct from emotions and distinct from thoughts. So the working definition that I have for empathy is a question of where we're placing our attention. Are we placing our attention on our thoughts and ideas? Are we placing our attention on our emotions? Or are we placing our attention on these types of qualities or motivations <laughs> <clears throat> that really uh, are what motivate any one of us to do anything. And so it's that attention, a capacity to tune into a world that's essentially vibrational, uh, that to me is a <laughs> part of empathic connection. Sorry for the coughing. I'm just getting over a cold, so it just kind of came back to me. So you're, you're talking about um, this quality of needs uh, in your understanding of, of empathy that we have, like these uh, qualities within ourselves, like hope, and uh, I think you mentioned a couple others, but that um, I know with, I, I, I myself have a little difficulty in, in tying that in with, uh, for example, uh, with the kind of the working definition model I have. Um, for example, I see in, in terms of needs that empathy, I mean, there's like scientific uh, ex, uh, um, explanation of like attachment, uh, how, you know, when babies are born, that there's this need that they have for attachment, that they're basically needing this empathic connection uh, to uh, kind of develop properly. And, you know, there's been um, different, uh, you know, researchers have kind of written about this. And, and so I see that as kind of like a need that empathy in itself is a need that we have. Does that kind of resonate? You know what I'm saying? I'm having, I have, I, I mean, I've, I've looked at NBC and that in the process, I'm still a little not clear on how it kind of fits with empathy and uh, needs. Um, because for me, the, for me, uh, NVC is a way of kind of deepening empathy between people. It's, it's kind of helping that mirroring process. So I can kind of mirror more of what it is, who you are through kind of needs like, oh, you're needing, you're needing hope. And that by hearing that, I'm able to mirror your uh, feeling and that resonance of hope. And it's like that it in itself kind of creates this connection. I don't know if I'm kind of making sense here, but it, I'm kind of like, it's something I'm trying to work on and kind of make sense of and am not quite clear on. So I hope, I'm not sure if I'm explaining it well or articulating it well. It sounds like there's uh, in within your framework a uh, experience something an 
a felt experience that you're referring to as resonance. And I think that uh, that felt experience of resonance, just as you say, is amplified by language. Language somehow has a, a you know, is central to that human experience of resonance. So by articulating these qualities, uh, such as the need to make a big difference in the world, <laughs> need to connect with other people or they just the need for understanding and clarity you know, the need to see the big picture or participate in the big picture so many of the things we've talked about uh, in this conversation and that I see motivating you my experience is that when we can give names to those felt experience and trade that with each other that that does create a quality of, of connection that is what you're calling resonance. That is uniquely human and is somehow tied to language. So that's why I see developing fluency with those words that have this vibrational or res resonance quality. That's how I see uh, uh, fluency in the world of needs as being part of the process that you're talking about. Yes. Helps in creating resonance. Yeah, so that the, the articulation of, of what I'm feeling into vocabulary and then sharing it with you is a way of uh, making that connection between us. Mm -hmm. And not just what you're feeling, but what is driving you. What is, what is motivating, what's important to you, what your priority is in this moment, in this dispute, or in this stage of your life. The capacity to see that and resonate with that with each other, and language is helpful. Language is part of it in some essential way. That's why I see empathic reflection, the ability to hear not just feelings, not just thoughts, but also values and motivations, these vibrational, vibrational qualities. That to me is really part of the capacity to connect. Mm -hmm. And if you were looking into yourself, what would you say is your value and, and need at the moment? In this moment? Yeah. Well, I'd like to, I have a sense of shared values with you. Uh, I have a need for partnership and collaboration because we share goals and none of us can do it alone. So I'm motivated to connect with you and the people that you're working with so that we can do something together, that we can have a shared understanding and shared purpose and an understanding of how we might realize that purpose. Okay, great. Um, well, there, there's a, uh, you asked me about wh what I see as key parts of this, of creating a culture of empathy. Mm -hmm. I have a few ideas I'd like to. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, what should we talk about next? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are many, um, like any skill, any skill development involves practice. It involves discipline. Uh, so one of the things I see as necessary is the development of uh, shared understanding of practices that help develop this quality and this capacity. Uh, and uh, so there are many uh, 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 different types of practices, but I think practices that begin with the body 
Okay. Now, let me just uh, stop for a second there. The Your video's gotten a little bit slower, so what I was going to do is just stop my video transmission to you. You won't see me, but I'll still be recording you. Is okay. That okay, because hopefully that might uh, give us a little bit more bandwidth. Um, okay, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I'm looking at your picture, so I'm imagining that I'm seeing real you. <laughs> uh I think there are a bunch of um, many different practices, but it's helpful to uh, all body-centered practices, I think, really helpful. Uh, one of the thought leaders who's really, who has really influenced me is a South African named Michael Brown. And he speaks of pathways of awareness, of a pathway towards being able to connect with the vibrational dimension. And he says that it starts with the body. And I think many, if you look at many, many uh, religions and spiritual practices that are designed to develop this capacity, they very often start with the body. Whether well, let me, um, one thing, the, the connection has gotten uh, worse. Uh, and so I was thinking I'm going to hang up and just call you back real quick. Okay. I think that might help uh, restore it. So I'll just hang up and call right back. Hey. Hopefully that helps. How's that? Um, it's a little bit better. You were, it was really starting to break up quite a bit. It's still... Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's better, much better. So yeah, you were talking about um, so, this person who talks about. I guess it's about body awareness. Was that 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 you know, physical pra daily physical practices, whether that be meditation, which I happen to think is extremely uh, effective, or yoga, or uh, dance, whatever it is you love to do with your body. Um, I think uh, taking care of one's physical health and um, uh, doing body-centered practices, practices that are likely to develop body awareness, are very helpful. Uh, resonance is a felt experience in the body. And if we want to develop the capacity to experience that, uh, we want to take care of our bodies as if they are our instrument. When I'm working with people in conflict, I'm using my body almost like a tuning fork. Uh, and that's the experience, that's, that's the field in which I actually feel what's going on. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be working energetically, uh, and develop the capacity to connect with the energy uh, of life in the context that you're working, all body-centered practices, but particularly meditation because of its uh, capacity to develop, develop body awareness are very good. Um, there are uh, those who are doing uh, research in neuroscience who are finding that body awareness deepens empathic capa capacity and that totally rings true with my own experience uh, in my own work. I work uh, not only as a mediator but I work extensively as a conflict coach mm -hmm. and in my work as in both areas, I'm using my body all the time. So I think uh, developing a culture of uh, empathy could begin with developing a, a community of practice around building self-awareness with body-centered practices. So it's really, I, I like that. It's like thinking of your body as... as uh... As, as I guess you're saying like almost like your tool, like you wanna, if you want to mirror 
and empathize with others that you wanting to uh, get your tool tuned, you know, to become sensitive and, and, uh, and that uh, meditation is, is one way of doing that. And all, all these body centered uh, processes that are out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like a musician, you're, or an athlete, your body is your instrument. And when you're talking about creating felt resonance as your central processes, central process, your body is key. And uh, uh, body-centered practices such as meditation are essential skills for developing that capacity. Uh, what do you do personally uh, along those lines? Well, uh, I am a daily, I am one of those folks who does believe in the value of spending every day, a little bit of time every day on a meditation cushion. Uh, but there are men, but I also have to, various forms of uh, exercise. I'm, I happen to really believe in the value of walking. And uh, there's so much of the uh, neuroscience that now uh, confirms the value of virtually any rhythmic activity in terms of generating wellness and inner peace. So anything you can do with a beat is really good. I'm also a big fan of the work of Gabriella Roth uh, and using dance as a form of spiritual practice. But uh, there's uh, so many wonderful uh, opportunities that's that are now available to us in the West in terms of uh, the martial arts and uh, Qigong and yoga. Uh, we're very blessed uh, to have had the world brought to us here in the West. And there's much we can learn from uh, other cultures in terms of how to generate a robust humanity in ourselves. Well, I can just mention that uh, for myself, it's dance. So uh, every week or every two weeks, I do kind of like a freestyle type dance, maybe a little bit along the lines of Gabrielle Roth. She does this um, kind of this, the four rhythms, I think. But uh, this is just freestyle, just, you know, move any which way. And it really kind of gets me into my body. I, it's just the one thing that kind of keeps me sane. So. <laughs> The other thing I want to talk about is coaching, uh, because this is uh, actually how I developed um, my own capacity for empathy as a mediator. Was in a I learned it from a coach, mm. and uh, <laughs> coaching has become a, a very uh, popular uh, modality now for a variety of things, and there are many. And so now a huge portion of my uh, dispute resolution practice is uh, what I call conflict coaching, but it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, by phone. Uh, and now with phone and Skype being what it is, you can have a private conversation with anyone anywhere in the world for, if not for free, for very little money. And... Uh, Coaching is convenient. It's at people's schedules since uh, it's uh, through the uh, internet or by phone. And really is an excellent way uh, to develop skills. And I believe that uh, empathy can be taught and um, supported in one another. And so I'd like to raise the profile of coaching really as a modality that I think has great promise in terms of developing our capacity for, for empathy. I have uh, lawyers, mediators, people in conflict all over the globe in every English-speaking country in my coaching practice. And from that experience, I know that, Edwin, you've put your finger on an experience that um, we are waking up to all over the globe. 
And I think coaching is one of the manifestations of that uh, need for to use interpersonal connection as a way of developing our effectiveness and our humanity. So to build a culture of empathy, one thing we can do is all the different mindfulness, uh, sensory awareness practices that are out there. Yes. And then there's this next level of of coaching, which is kind of like empathic listening, perhaps. Um, a little bit of what we're doing here, but, uh, you know, listening to one person, kind of being, uh, uh, doing reflecting and um, like that. Is, is that, am I hearing that right? A absolutely. Uh, empathy is a central process in the coaching relationship. It's not, in, in my own coaching practice, it, begins by offering empathy to my clients so that they can have an experience of being uh, a feeling felt and of having someone really get uh, where you are and articulate that for you in a way that you could have never articulated for yourself. Uh, then I teach people to do that for themselves, the, the self-empathy part that you were referring to. Um, then, then they move on to being able to offer that for others and uh, then in whatever conflicted situation that they're working on, they learn skills for how in real time to use this capacity to resolve their own conflicts. That's how it works in my coaching practice, but yes, you're absolutely right. This conversation that we're having now is a uh, uh, you know has an essence has in its essence that kind of conversation. So just to recap here, it's mindfulness coaching, and then working on the self empathy. Um, can you go into more depth into the self empathy? What you're meaning there? Well. In uh, uh, for me, I think of that first as starting to develop an awareness just of what it is that I'm thinking, because usually repetitive thoughts are a sure sign to me that I'm in some way energetically hooked and that I need to pay attention to it. Um, starting to be able to articulate for myself with some kind of radical honesty what I'm, what my genuine emotional state is, that's a very important part of self-empathy. But then uh, uh, perhaps most value is starting to get a sense of what my values are whether you call them needs, values, priorities, not only articulating, but uh, prioritizing uh, my own needs and values. I, I would say an absolute turning point in my life was when I put peace at the top of my own list. Might be another need uh, that is at the top of your list or somebody else's, but just that process of articulating for myself, what is the central value that where I'm going to stake my claim that is really most important to me? That's what I'm talking about is self-empathy, that process of being able to see one's thoughts with radical honesty, confront one's own emotions, and then with... Uh, real curiosity, see what it is, um, the full range of what it is that's uh, motivating you and, and starting to give some language and priority to that. It's a great, huge value to that. Do you remember when you had that awareness of empathy, I mean, of uh, peace being like a core value? Do you remember the date and time and kind of the, the story of how that happened? Yeah, it's, it's nothing more simple than having sat, paid attention um, 
over a course of weeks and writing down um, the needs that were coming up for me in a particular situation and then just sitting down with that list of needs that I had made for myself of all the different, at first when I started self-empathy, it was almost overwhelming to see how many things were coming up as priorities. Um, but again, in the context of a coaching relationship, I was encouraged to sit down with the list and just make my own priorities. Uh, and again, empathy is a felt experience in the body. When I just wrote peace at the top of the list, it was a felt experience, a felt experience of, yes, that's it. And uh, I've re returned to that. It's just helped me over time to return to what is important to me. And as I say, it could be it's something else for likely is um, for anybody else but just as you're trying to make a central organizing concept or by raising the profile of empathy in culture uh, the same thing happens when you do that for yourself when you uh, uh, come up with your own central organizing principle makes the rest of your life a lot easier and life is hard life is hard for all of us so having some place of return that deeply does it for you it's it's a uh, it's something that actually makes life easier certainly has made my life a lot easier well i've done uh, some video projects where I asked uh, people about what's your most important value and it and actually it was a project on progressive values I was asking well what are progressive values be conservatives we're talking about conservative values and so uh, it was interesting that the, that the, the values people came up with you know caring responsibility justice and so forth and and I would say, well, tell me the story of how those values became important to you. And, you know, some people would just kind of break down in tears as they recounted the stories of, you know, how those values became important. And it was actually that uh, that project that kind of led me uh, to empathy, you know, for myself being one of the central values. Mm -hmm. I think you're, you've really hit it, Edwin. It is true that... Um, uh, empathy is a, hu a huge unmet need <laughs> uh, for all of us. And uh, you really are doing uh, all of us a great service, I think, by raising its profile, lifting it up, for all of us to try on and see, does it fit? Uh, I And... Uh, I like the shopping metaphor of uh, trying on clothes and seeing if they fit. And self-empathy is that kind of process of trying something on and seeing if it, what the felt experience is. If it fits, you can feel it. Yeah, I have been kind of looking at this because i kind of trying to uh, raise the value of empathy within society. And I find... As I talk to people, they have different values, like you're saying, well, it'll be peace or it'll be justice or it'll be responsibility or freedom. So one thing I'm looking at is how do all those values relate to each other? Because there is some kind of a connection. Um, for example, you're talking about uh, peace being your value. And there's a quote that I just love by Johann Galtung, who's done a lot of uh, started a lot of these peace and conflict studies programs in the universities. I understand he's kind of like the a real founder around that. And he says, uh, paraphrasing here, uh, peace is resolving conflict with empathy, nonviolence, and creativity, and it's a never-ending process. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So that's kind of the relationship, right? It's like tying peace and uh, empathy together. And so I'm looking, that's a whole nother project. We won't get into that, but you know, how does empathy relate to freedom? How does empathy relate to justice? And um, so have all these other projects in the work. Uh, 
you know, Edwin, all values, all needs are part of a transcendent uh, whole. They're, they are all interconnected. Um, so that's the beauty of it. It doesn't really matter where you start. Just as you say, one will lead to the other. In some ways, you could say culture of empathy, empathy is just a culture of values, living from a place of values. Um, because that, uh, we, we all contain the complete set. And, um, you know, my connection to peace was, that was a very personal value, right? It's not, I wasn't thinking of the world. That was just what I wanted in my life. That's what I wanted for myself. Um, but that's a, that's a constantly shifting thing. I can imagine that there might be other times in my life where something else would be much more important. And I can, I can just by reflecting on different times in my life, I know there have been other things that have been important. So I don't think, think of that as being some, something static and fixed. I think once you start connecting with this transcendent, interconnected, dimension of needs and values um, it, it, it's infinite where that will lead you because they're all interconnected well you had uh, mentioned uh, mindfulness coaching and self-empathy you know in terms of ways of building a culture of empathy were there more that you wanted to cover uh, just in the, I would expand the concept of self-empathy to really include uh, any kind of self-care. Uh, going back to where we began with, you can only give what you have. Well, uh, you know, I've asked a lot of people, a lot of academics and so forth, you know, tell me about empathy and kind of exploring it. And I've, I'm starting a new uh this, this series here that we're doing now, I call it Dialogues on Building a Culture of Empathy. I'm going to start another series called Empathizing with Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> and I've already done three of these where it's like, uh, you know, be it therapists or, or coaches or whatever, that it's just empathizing with me. And it's, kind of, it's coming out of uh, this uh, video I saw of... Where they it was it, from the '60s, they they had Carl Rogers, Fritz Perls, and some other well-known therapists, and they all worked at different times on the same person. I and love the word. The woman is Gloria, and so you know Carl Rogers. You see his methodology. You know, just reflecting, reflecting. Fritz Perls. It's you know, let's really get this person aggravated, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and really get them to you know scream or something and then so you you can come you can actually see them so i'm going to be i'm opening myself up so uh you're welcome to uh, take part in that too so <laughs> but um well we've gone for about an hour um so is there maybe we could wrap up the interview component or the dialogue component is there any final thoughts you'd like to share uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to you, Edwin. Uh, really, I, I'm, I'm joyful that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, it needed to be done. Uh, so I'm celebrating your clarity, um, your and your accomplishment and your uh, work ethic and your commitment um, to really contribute something that is uh, has great value, uh, a beautiful, sustainable, renewable resource that's right in all of our consciousness. Um, and I'm, I'm just really enjoying the companionship uh, because this is something that where I've, these are where I've planted my pole. Empatia is empathy and 
Italian and Patio Resolutions is my business, and that's my that's my work in the world too. So I'm I'm grateful for the partnership. I'm uh, impressed with your leadership and your vision, and just grateful to be in relationship with you. I, I, yeah, thank you. I, I really enjoy it, and I can really feel the connection. Just uh, talking to you, you have an, this way of slowing things down. It feels very calm, very warm, uh, very like a lot of space, and I, I really enjoy that. It really, um, I find it very relaxing. Good. <laughs> <laughs> So with that final words, I'll just stop the recording here in the uh, dialogue is to an end. I did want to see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.